Welcome to Reconnect, the podcast dedicated to sharing and defending the good news of Jesus Christ. All religions except Christianity require mankind to work to overcome our greatest problem. It is in Christianity alone that we have divine redemption through the person and work of Jesus of Nazareth, who through his life, death, and resurrection defeated sin, death, and the devil forever. Reconnect us, O Lord. Welcome to episode 40 of Reconnect, already at the big 4-0, and it is Christmas week 2015, so wishing you a Merry Christmas, and this will be a second Christmas-themed episode for 2015. This time, I will be sharing about the 12 days of Christmas. It was a few years ago I received a series of emails from Pastor Al Espinoza of St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Irvine, California, currently Irvine, California. They're renting space from uh, the school I teach at, Kareen Lutheran, a wonderful pastor, wonderful congregation, visited there once, and I've heard nothing bad about this congregation. Every time I've encountered this pastor, I've been truly blessed uh, by his teachings. And so I have been on his mailing list for a few years now from the one time I did visit their congregation, and uh, I always really received good information. And this one year during Christmas time, he sent out a daily email about the 12 days of Christmas. And it was based on the song 12 Days of Christmas. Obviously, the 12 Days of Christmas doesn't come from that song. Uh, but the emails were based on that song, which I'm sure many of you are aware with, uh, or aware of the song which, uh, sings about on the first day of Christmas, my true love gave to me. Dun, 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 dun. And it goes on through the 12 days, giving these different gifts. The first day, a partridge in a pear tree. The second, two turtle doves. Uh, the third day, three French hens. Uh, but the way this email series that he sent out, what it did was it explained how each of these uh, gifts on these days can have a certain particular connection to something of the Christian faith. Uh And I thought this was really awesome, Uh, and it changes the way that I look at this song. Just before I really get into all of these 12, let me just share what the first one is. The first one, the partridge in a pear tree, uh, this refers to, one, the true love refers to God, but two, uh, this partridge in a pear tree refers to God hidden in Christ, born in the stable. And so Christ is your greatest gift. Uh, and then on the first day of Christmas, which star- uh, which starts on December 25th, so Christmas is the first day of Christmas, it's not the last day. So on the first day of Christmas, Christ is revealed, and he is in fact the reason for the season. Uh, so that's just a little preface of how uh, each of these gifts in the song, the 12 days of Christmas, have Christian parallels. Now, what uh, Pastor Al Spinoza uh, shared, you know, was that I, he didn't, I think, say that this was intentionally uh, a song that was written with these in mind. Uh, he didn't say that at all. Uh, and he indicated likely that that wasn't the case. Uh, but looking at Snopes, uh, many of you are familiar with Snopes, that site which goes and looks at things that are commonly held to be true and runs them through to see uh, if they are or are not. Uh, they have a claim on Snopes. The song, The Twelve Days of Christmas, was created as a coded reference to important articles of the Christian faith. They came out and clearly said false. However, like Pastor Al was pointing out, uh, I still think this is something that can be uplifting to us and also remind us that when it comes to Christmas, we have not just one day we can celebrate and enjoy, but we do in fact have 12 days. Uh, and I will explain what those 12 days are at the end of this podcast. Uh, so let's get rolling a little bit more on this Snopes thing. Here's an example of the claim. You know, these these claims that Snopes usually looks at are sometimes email chains that are sent out. So this is an excerpt from one of those such emails. It says, you're all familiar with the song, The Twelve Days of Christmas, I think. To most, it's a delightful, nonsense rhyme set to music, but it had quite a serious purpose when it was written. It is a good deal more than just a repetitious melody with pretty phrases and a list of strange gifts. Catholics in England during the 1558 to 1829, when Parliament finally emancipated Catholics in England, were prohibited from any practice of their faith by law, private or public. It was a crime to be 
a Catholic. And of course, I don't like saying Catholic. I always like to say Roman Catholic, but that's just what the email here says. The 12 Days of Christmas was written in England as one of the, quote, catechism songs to help young Catholics learn the tenets of their faith. A memory aid, when to be uh, when to be caught with anything in writing indicating adherence to the Catholic faith could not only get you imprisoned, it could get you hanged or shortened by a head or hanged, drawn, and quartered, a rather peculiar and ghastly punishment I'm not aware was ever practiced anywhere else. Hanging, drawing, and quartering involved hanging a person by the neck until they had almost, but not quite, suffocated to death. Then the party was taken down from the gallows and disemboweled while still alive, and while the entrails were still lying on the street, where the executioners stomped all over them, the victim was tied to four large farm animals and literally torn into five parts, one to each limb and to the remaining torso. Wow, that sounds really intense. Uh, so under this uh, sort of environment, I think we can understand why maybe someone would have encoded songs or messages in order to be able to openly teach the faith without having to face such punishment. Uh, but there's there's a lot that goes against uh, this theory. So Snopes says two very large red flags indicate that the claim about the secret origins of the song, The Twelve Days of Christmas, is nothing more than a fanciful tale, similar to the many apocryphal hidden meanings of various nursery rhymes. There is absolutely no documentation or supporting evidence for this claim whatsoever other than mere repetition of the claim itself. Also, the claim appears today only to the 1990s, making it as likely an invention of modern-day speculation rather than historical fact. However, Snopes does say it is possible that the 12 days of Christmas has been confused with or is a transformation of a song called A New Dial, also known as In Those 12 Days, which dates to at least 1625 and assigns religious meanings to each of the 12 days of Christmas, but not for the purpose of teaching a catechism. I love that. All right, so uh, this to me is really cool. Uh, that is exactly what Pastor Al shared in his. He kept making comparisons back to this uh, song called A New Dial, which originated not in England, but in France. Uh, so I'll share the lyrics to A New Dial in a moment, but uh, A New Dial literally goes through 12 days of Christmas, and uh, the things shared in each of these days can have a good parallel to what we see in uh, the 12 days of Christmas. So a lot of fun, I think, can be had with this. And again, the idea I'm thinking on this is we got 12 days to celebrate. Maybe the church can start celebrating 12 days of Christmas. And uh, when we hear this common song, which to me I've never enjoyed because it was so repetitive uh, and so long, and to me not as enjoyable as many of the other Christmas songs that we have, um, this really gives me new meaning to this, and I find a lot of joy now in the song where I normally wouldn't have. All right, uh, so just continuing on the whole uh, Snopes thing, something else that they pointed out, and this is also something that Pastor Al pointed out, was that uh, this being actually a song that was created as code uh, for Roman Catholics to be able to teach the Catholic faith without being able to have access to a catechism doesn't really hold much water because pretty much all of the points uh, that are going to be drawn to the Bible from the song, The Twelve Days of Christmas, uh, none of them, besides the number of sacraments that there are, can in any way be a problem with uh, Protestants. These are all points of just the Christian faith that Roman Catholics and Protestants share in common. So that's a, that, that's another big ding about uh, this song purposely being written as code uh, by Roman Catholics to be able to teach the Catholic faith. But anyways, uh, here, here's the closing statement that Snopes made on this topic. Nonetheless, plenty of writers continue to expound upon the beauty and truly biblical and spiritual meanings locked away in this wonderful song that puts Christ into Christmas where he doesn't appear to be. Perhaps those who consider this tale to be beautiful and inspirational, despite its obviously du dubious truthfulness, should consider its underlying message that one group of Jesus' followers had to hide their beliefs in order to avoid being tortured and killed by another group of Jesus' followers. Of all the as aspects of Christianity to celebrate at Christmas time, that doesn't sound like a particularly good one to emphasize. And so uh, I think that's just something to reflect on ourselves, how 
there is division within the body of Christ to ask questions, why is there division in the body of Christ? And how should we actually respond to that division? And how do we respond to such uh, horrific uh, actions within church history. So those will be topics in the new year that I would really like to address on the show. Uh, but for now, let's get back into this 12 days of Christmas. All right. So, uh, for those of you that are not familiar with this, a new dial, which the Snopes article referenced, as well as the email series I got from Pastor Al Espinoza, um, I found it online. Uh, it comes from musicanet.org. Uh, here is their introduction that they have. It says, An almanac from 1625 in the Backford Collection contains the song A New Dial, which was probably already quite old when the almanac was printed from the Oxford Book of Carols, 1928. All right, so here's the chorus. In those twelve days, let us be glad, for God of his power hath all things made. And then it goes through the twelve. It says, What are they that are but one? What are they that are but one? We have one God alone, and heaven above sits on his throne. What are they which are by two? Two testaments, the old and new, we do acknowledge to be true. What are they which are but three? Three persons in the Trinity, which make one God in unity. What are they which are but four? Four sweet evangelists there are, Christ's birth, life, death, which do declare. What are they which are but five? Five senses, like five kings, maintain in every man a several reign. What are they which are but six? Six days to labor is not wrong, for God himself did work so long. What are they which are but seven? Seven liberal arts hath God sent down, with divine skill man's soul to crown. What are they which are but eight? Eight beatitudes are there given, use them right and go to heaven. Ooh. <laughs> what are they which are but nine? Nine muses like the heaven's nine spheres, with sacred tunes entice our ears. What are they which are but ten? Ten statues God to Moses gave. Which? Statutes, sorry. Ten statutes God to Moses gave, which kept or broke to spill or save. What are they which are but eleven? Eleven thousand virgins did partake and suffer death for Jesus' sake. What are they which are but twelve? Twelve are attending on God's Son. Twelve make our creed. The dial's done. All right, so that's the new dial and the theory or idea at least that has emerged by some people, is that the 12 days of Christmas could be riffing off a new dial. And each of these images here could have particular meaning to the Bible. Now, uh, being able to prove this for sure uh, and to definitely show that this emerged intentionally uh, as a way to teach the catechism in a time where the Roman Catholic catechism wasn't available, Snope says is definitely false. And if you read their full article, it's a very compelling case. Uh, but let's just go through this for our own amusement and joy. Uh, so the 12 days of Christmas, uh, the first day, the true love gives a partridge in a pear tree, which I already shared was God hidden in Christ, born in a stable. So again, stables, wood, that's kind of references to a tree. Uh, the partridge is in the tree, sort of hidden. Uh, so th that's how Christ comes to us. Um, it's God hidden in human flesh. And this is, again, the whole reason we have Christmas. So day one is the best gift of all. The two turtle doves, uh, this refers to the Old and New Testaments, as the New Dial says. Uh, and it's through the Old and New Testaments that we know who Jesus Christ is. Christ himself says, speaking of the Scriptures, and at this time when he's speaking, the Scriptures were only the Old Testament, he says, they all testify about me. So all Scripture points to and testifies about Jesus Christ. This is definitely a hermeneutic that Lutherans have, and I believe most Christians probably have this, but I don't always see this uh, through preaching of certain uh, individuals. Uh, but this idea that when we look at any text, we should be able to see how it points to Jesus. We should be, when we are taking the text and applying it to ourselves, we should be explaining how Jesus is found within that text and how it shows Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. Three French hens is the gift on the third day. So three French hens uh, refers to faith, hope, and love. Uh, this comes from 1 Corinthians 13, in which Paul says, In the end, three things shall last, faith, hope, and love. In the new dial, however, uh, 
So I, I don't know where this is coming from exactly. If you go online, you always and search this yourself. You'll see most people list faith, hope, and love as the free as the three French hens. Uh, the new dial that I read though does not say uh, these three French hens should be looking to these theological virtues or these Christian virtues of faith, hope, and love, uh, but instead to the three persons: the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, and if you go back and just kind of compare day one in the new dial. To day three, I like how it says this, what are they that are but one? What are they, right? This is they are, we have one God alone. Uh, but then on day three, what are they which are but three, three persons? So you see the doctrine of the Trinity laid out there. Uh, what are they? These are persons. We have one God. Uh, so three persons, one God. That's the Trinity. Uh, four calling birds uh, is day four's gift. Uh, four calling birds refers to the four gospels and or the four evangelists. Uh, so Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they wrote gospels. Gospels means good news. Uh, evangelism is sharing good news, and evangelist is one who shares good news. Uh, and the good news that we get through the gospels is that of Jesus Christ's life, death, and resurrection, uh, which the New Dial song says is a very sweet message. Uh, five golden rings is the gift on the fifth day of Christmas. It refers to the first five books of the Old Testament, uh, commonly called the Pentateuch, or in uh, Jews would refer to it as the Torah. The Torah is not actually the Old Testament. I know a lot of Christians think that, uh, or maybe even some Jews think that. A lot of people have that impression for some reason. Uh, but the Torah is actually the books of Moses, which are the first five books of the Old Testament, or the Tanakh, as called by Jews. Uh, oftentimes, the word Torah is translated as law, which would be a very uh, poor translation. Uh, when we hear that, we usually think of the first five books then being books of God's law. And of course, there is a lot of law in those books, but there is also a lot of gospel good news in those passages as well. I mean, from the very beginning, it's good news that God just created us, that he gave us life. And then when we sin and fall into uh, this this cursed state of existence that we now find ourselves, God in his mercy promises a savior. So in Genesis 3, we get the first proclamation and prophecy of the Messiah, of the Christ. And also in Genesis 3 there, you see Christ making, or you see God making the first sacrifice of killing of an animal to make clothing, which would cover Adam and Eve and their nakedness, which comes from the result of their sin. So good news abounding forth uh, in the first five books of the Old Testament. Uh, in the New Dial, uh, these are referred to not as to the five books, but to five senses. So sight, taste, hearing, smell, and touch. All right, day six of the 12 Days of Christmas song, the, the True Love gives six geese a lane. This refers to the six days of creation. And of course, on the seventh day, God rested. And uh, in the New Testament, we hear talk of um, this seventh day being entering into God's rest, which those of us who are in Christ have entered into this rest. We no longer must work for our salvation. We must. We see that we do not have to earn righteousness or earn our place, but instead it has been given to us as a gift. Uh, but again, I think just thinking of the six days of creation, there is a lot there for us to celebrate. The creation of the world, God said, was very good good at the end of day six and at the end of every other day god said it was good uh, so there is much we can enjoy and celebrate and rejoice in when we look at the world and we know that when christ returns revelation says that he's going to make all things new again so many of the great and wonderful things of creation now we will also be able to enjoy in heaven in a sinless state. Now, when I say in heaven, that's actually a new heaven, new earth, because again, the heaven and earth then meet, and there is a new heaven and new earth. It's a recreation. So awesome thing, uh, I think, as well, when we think of these six days of creation is looking ahead to the creation that we will get to enjoy forever in paradise with our Lord. All right, day seven. Uh, the true love gives seven swans a swimming. Uh, this refers to the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. 
the seven or the seven sacraments. And uh, uh, Lutherans do not have seven sacraments. We just have two. Uh, but the Roman Catholic Church uh, has seven sacraments. And it's through all of these that the Roman Catholics believe there is grace given. Uh, we, as Lutherans, uh, say that there are only two sacraments, baptism and communion, and that grace is given through both of these. And again, this is maybe even looking forward to 2016 then. I want to have some episodes on baptism and communion and how uh, grace is given in those and promised in those by Jesus Christ in Scripture. Uh, but from the popular... Uh, but from the popular symbol song, uh, the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit uh, is listed. Uh, this is based on Isaiah 11, 2-3. Uh, but you must use the Latin Vulgate to squeeze seven gifts out of the text. And I'm getting this part from Pastor Al's uh, devotion because uh, I did not know this one. All English translations that Pastor Al knows of only list six gifts, uh, but to borrow from the Vulgate, so the Latin translation of the Old Testament, the seven gifts of the Spirit are these, wisdom, understanding, counsel, fortitude, knowledge, piety, uh, the one that doesn't flow from our English versions, <laughs> uh, and then seven, the fear of the Lord. Uh, from a new dial song, there is an entirely different approach taken. Uh, it's the seven liberal arts, uh, which are grammar, rhetoric, logic, arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. All right, keep moving on then. Uh, on the eighth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me eight maids of milking. Uh, this refers to the eight Beatitudes, and I'm a horrible singer. Uh, here they are, uh, the blessed statements of Christ from Matthew 5, uh, verses 3 to 12. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And if you count this up, you actually see nine blessed here. Uh, in Pastor Al's email that he sent out, he said that this ninth blessed could maybe be seen as a summary of the other eight. Uh, but what I find very awesome is that this is the start of the Sermon on the Mount, and I personally see a lot of the Sermon on the Mount to be a reminder that we are not righteous in and of ourselves. We have broken God's law, and what I believe people were doing at this time, because there's a key verse in the Sermon on the Mount where it says, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees, you shall not inherit the kingdom of heaven. And so everyone will be going, whoa. Well, whose righteousness can surpass that of the Pharisees? No one's. Uh, and what Jesus is leading them to see is that we are not saved by our works, but instead through his very word given to us and faith in that word, faith in his works. All right. Uh, so uh, on this, what's interesting then is that all the people who are blessed and inherit the kingdom of heaven are people that at this time the Jews would have looked at and said, surely this person is not blessed. Surely this person is not inheriting the kingdom of heaven. And it's because of the state that they're in. These are people who are weak. These are people who are broken. These are people who are mourning. And it's even our tendency today that when we see someone really beat, really broken, we sit there and go, well, what have they done wrong? We all seem to want to live under karma, that these bad things that happen in our life are a result of bad things that we have done. And people who are blessed, we're looking at it outwardly by physical belongings, physically good health. Things like that. So I uh, really think uh, Jesus is just really giving it to them in a way which is just shocking them to death that all these people who the world and people who are self-righteous would look at and go, there's no way these people are inheriting the kingdom of heaven. Uh, and this is really good news to us because it means we can be we can rejoice and be glad knowing that in Christ we do have heaven despite whatever our current situations may be, uh, and all the more reminded of this at Christmas when we consider our Lord coming as a little babe born in a manger. 
uh, with no place to lay his head. Uh, so very, very awesome stuff there. Eight maids of milky. Uh, for the Beatitudes. Nine ladies dancing. This refers to the nine fruits of the Holy Spirit. Uh, these come from Galatians 5, 22 to 23. Uh, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. So that's really awesome. And then uh, in Pastor Al's uh, daily devos that he sent out that one Christmas, uh, for this one he said that Stott, whoever Stott is, uh, in his book, Baptism and Fullness, argues that the nine fruit especially cover our relationship, one, God, so the first three fruits, love, joy, and peace, is between our relationship and God. The second uh, segment here is our relationship with our neighbor, fruits four to six, which is having patience with our neighbor, uh, be kind to our neighbor, and to be good to our neighbor. And finally, for ourselves, fruits in seven through nine, uh, that we need to be faithful, uh, gentle, and self-control. And again, I, I like how I just said, well, we need to be. But again, this is in Christ. The Holy Spirit brings these fruits out in our lives. Uh, so these are promises uh, to be in the lives of believers. And uh, I should, I want to go through the Sermon on the Mount and show how typically uh, people oftentimes take the Sermon on the Mount and other passages like this and turn these into things that will be judged by ourselves uh, in order to count who is in and who isn't in uh, salvation or in Christ. And uh, it's, a, it's a really big no-no. We are not capable of judging such things as sinful human beings. And uh, that's, that's all I'll say on that for now. Uh, in the new dial, though, uh, it definitely says that these are nine spheres, planets, uh, and that this is supposed to represent music, which is truly a good gift of the Lord to us. Another episode I want to have sometime in 2016 is on music and how music points to a creator. It's fascinating stuff if you ever looked into that. All right. On the 10th day of Christmas, uh, the true love gave 10 lords a-leaping, uh, which refers to the 10 commandments. Uh, 11 pipers piping. Uh, this refers to the 11 faithful apostles. In the new dial, it says the 11,000 virgins, which is a throw to... Uh, revelation in which you get the 144,000 you get gosh what is the 11,000 versions from because that's not 11,000 lined up in that I don't know where the 11,000 comes from I should have done more research on that one I thought it was revelation but that's that's completely wrong uh, it's in revelation you got the 12 tri 12 tribes of Israel lined out as 12,000 uh, fighting men essentially and these were virgins there uh, because these are youthful men that are prepared to die for battle. But I know the 11,000 virgins is pointing to martyrs is what I found online. Uh, so uh, actually, that's what the new dial actually says, the martyrs. Those willing to die for Christ that have suffered. So uh, 11,000 virgins that have suffered. Uh, so this is the church suffering, and uh, martyrdom is uh, a testimony. Martyrdom comes from a word which means witness. So those who die for the faith are witnessing for Christ. Okay, finally, 12 drummers drumming. This is the last day of Christmas, the 12th day. Uh, this refers to the 12 points of doctrine in the Apostles' Creed, or it refers to the 12 apostles. And on. This wouldn't be Judas, but this would be the one that replaced him. And then, of course, you get Paul being uh, grafted in as one abnormally born as an apostle. So really, there would be thin. If you count Judas, there would be 14 apostles uh, in total. Uh, so I, I don't like saying 12 apostles for this one. I, I really do like that answer of the 12 points of doctrine in the Apostles' Creed. Uh, and these 12 points then, the Apostles' Creed can be broken into 12 statements. The first one, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Second one, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. Third one, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. Fourth one, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. Fifth one, he descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. Sixth one, he ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. Seventh one, from thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. Eighth one, I believe in the Holy Spirit. Ninth one, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints. Tenth one, the forgiveness of sins. The eleventh, the resurrection of the dead. And twelve, the life everlasting. Amen. So, twelve doctrinal points of the Apostles' Creed. And when, let me go back to the new dial lyrics on this one. 
they said, what are they but our 12? 12 are tending on God's son. 12 make our creed. Uh, so pretty cool stuff there. Uh, if you want to know more on the Apostles' Creed, I've been listening to a podcast called So What? with a question mark at the end. Uh, one of the hosts of that, I guess he's the key host, but there are other regular hosts with him, is Kyle Bashirs, And he was a guest on episode three of Reconnect, and he shared about Scientology with me. So uh, if you want, go back and listen to episode three. You can hear Kyle talk about Scientology. Uh, or you can, I would say, if you really want to know more on this, go look up So What? They interview different uh professors and th- i think these these professors i feel like they're coming from a baptist background uh but these professors uh go through each of these lines and speak on them and it's really awesome so far all right so to wrap up there are 12 days of christmas all right this is a real thing some of us may be thinking 12 days of christmas what a stupid song there's only one day who celebrates 12 days of christmas actually there are 12 days of christmas here's how it breaks down uh christmas uh is on december 25th we all know that but then on january 5th this is the last day before a new church season begins uh which is epiphanies uh so in the church there are different seasons uh epiphanies pentecost lent no it's not lent is it is epiphanies lent i think it's then pentecost i think is the name of the other season and then advent uh and so epiphanies begins january 6th in the western church so the orthodox church they have a different schedule than the western church uh, but there's from December 25th then to January 5th is all days of Christmas uh, before the next church season begins. And I think most Christians, even, no matter if you go to a church that follows this type of calendar or not, are familiar with Lent and Christmas. So here we go. Here's some of the key highlights of the 12 days of Christmas. This should give you a lot more to celebrate and to rejoice about and to think about and to meditate on during this Christmas season. And definitely gives you a whole lot more to be thankful for. Uh, there are 12 days of Christmas. The 25th is the Incarnation. Uh, so we're celebrating the Incarnation of Christ, the birth. Of course, the Incarnation began with the conception. Uh, but we got the birth that we observe, December 25th. December, 22, uh, D- December 26th, so the second day of Christmas, is St. Stephen's Day. And this is on the Feast of Stephen. Stephen was the first martyr in the Bible recorded. Uh, he is witnessing uh, to the death uh, in, in will and deed. Uh, and so this is a day we observe. Uh, the 27th, this is John the Baptist martyrdom. Uh, the 28th, which would then be the fourth day of Christmas, this is the Feast of the Holy Innocents. On the Feast of the Holy Innocents, this is remembering the little ones that were killed by King Herod. Uh, he was trying to kill Christ and uh, this is where in Scripture, Mary and Joseph get warning from an angel in a dream to flee to Egypt, and they stay there for three years before coming back to settle in Nazareth. With the Feast of the Holy Innocents, uh, I think this could be really cool for us to think on too, uh, to pray for those that are aborted during this time. There are many, many people who are never born because their mothers have decided to have them killed. And these are definitely, I think, those that are being persecuted and attacked by Satan throughout Scripture. Satan always goes after the little ones, the unborn, the defenseless, the voiceless. And so on this day, uh, maybe consider posting something about the holy innocence and point to and reflect on the massacre of the unborn uh, in our own culture. Uh, Then there's a break for a while. January 1st, this is the eighth day of Christmas. Uh, This is the feast of the name and circumcision of Jesus Christ. So in Jewish culture, or as commanded by God, actually, uh, male babies were circumcised on the eighth day. And this is also when they are named. So on the eighth day, January 1st, is the feast of the name and circumcision of Jesus. And then the last day of Christmas, January 5th, this is the day when we observe uh, the Magi coming. So January 5th is the day of the Magi. 
All right, so I hope you are blessed by this. I hope that the next time you hear the 12 days of Christmas, you may not be like me and go, oh, it's so long, it's so repetitive, who cares? Uh, but really think on this and go, yeah, maybe I can think of some connections that I can make to Scripture here. Uh, probably they weren't intentionally written in there. It's probably just a goofy song. But there could be a good chance that, you know, this song was riffing off a new dial somehow. If that's the case, awesome. If not, I still see no reason we can't be thinking of such things uh, as we hear this song. And again, drive us to remember that we got 12 days to celebrate of Christ's incarnation and birth. Uh, and it's glorious news. For unto us a child has been given, and it's through him that we are reconnected into a right relationship with the Lord. God bless you all this Christmas season, which goes for 12 days. Your mission, if you choose to accept it, share this episode on all of your social media sites and with your email contacts, people who will benefit from listening to the show. Thank you for listening. Reconnect us, O oh Lord.